This is the battlefield of Beaver Dam Creek. Lee's first strike. The Confederate plan did not call for an attack against the Union position along Beaver Dam Creek. Instead, a series of maneuvers would make the Union defenses here untenable. But poor communication and unexpected obstacles caused delays. Lee felt vulnerable. A large portion of his army lie isolated on the other side of the Chickahominy. He decided to test the Union defenses here while his primary plan unfolded. Southern infantrymen finally found, suddenly found themselves advancing from the village of Mechanicsville across nearly one mile of shell-swept ground behind you. Most of the regiments had seen little, if any, combat. Their inexperience quickly became apparent. Some units advanced too far. Others stubbornly, stubbornly held their ground along the creek bottom long after they should have fallen back. None advanced beyond the creek. The first battle of the most critical campaign in the Confederacy's short history ended disastrously. It says here, Alan Redwood served in the Confederate Army, survived the war and became a prominent sketch artist. His depiction of the Confederate attack has special authenticity because Beaver Dam Creek was his first experience in battle and he was wounded there. So here we are, Beaver Dam Creek along the Confederate line. Federals were across from 5 to 8 p.m. on June 26th, 1862. Beaver Dam Creek is one of the Seven Days Battles 1862. Mechanicsville, Beaver Dam Creek, Gaines Mill, Goodlands Farm, oh, Fair Oaks, I think it's also called, Savage Station, White Oak Swamp, Fraser's Farm, and then Malvern Hill. All the way around Richmond. Historic Cold Harbor Road. In this location ran the original road from Mechanicsville to Cold Harbor. The bridge that destroyed the bridge that crossed Beaver Dam Creek was destroyed by Union troops prior to the June 26, 1862 battle, and it was replaced by something I'm guessing that the Park Service erected. So this is the old Cold Harbor, Mechanicsville Road, site of Ellerson's Mill. The foundation of the mill was located in the depression below the roadbed down there. The mill race that supplied water to power the mill was built along the base of the hill and remnants can be seen today. The mill pond was located just beyond the modern Route 156 bridge. Down that way, I believe. Holding the high ground. Today's landscape makes it difficult to appreciate the many strengths of the Union position. The charging Confederates faced more obstacles than they could overcome. Open fields, steep slopes, a broad and swampy creek, Union infantry using a mill race for protection and powerfully positioned Union artillery crowning the ridge. These circumstances help explain how the Confederates lost 1,500 men here and the Federals only 350. Despite the de decisive victory here, Army Commander George B. McClellan decided to withdraw this exposed portion of his force on the night of June 26. Stonewall Jackson's Confederates stood poised to threaten the rear of this Beaver Dam Creek position. The first phase of the Confederate plan to drive the Union Army away from Richmond by maneuver had succeeded, but only after a battlefield defeat. Here's Ellerson's Mill. Here's the primary Union position I'm trying to stay out of the shadows here. And no race. Ellerson's Mill. When was this picture taken? I don't know. You are here on the other side. Dr. John Ellison's grist mill served the community before and after the war. It stood as the most noticeable landmark along the Union line. Although the building is gone, the mill race, visible to the left of the mill, still exists in the woods. Somewhere in there, I guess. I guess it's that depression. Now we're at the Chickahominy Bluff. Lee massed much of his own Confederate army at Chickahominy Bluff and surged over the river in a combined operation with Stonewall Jackson. And then there's action at Beaver Dam Creek, which we were just at. 
This is one of the smaller park service facilities, I think. Doesn't look like there's a walking trail or anything. Defending Richmond. The fortifications constructed by the Confederate Army in this vicinity and around Richmond are miles in extent, and I must add, they are as strong, if not the strongest, in the world. Julian Scott, Union Army veteran. Julian Scott was, of course, a painter, an illustrator, and a good one. But anyway, here we are, Chickahominy Bluff, above the Chickahominy. From the war's beginning, Confederate authorities struggled with the question of how to defend Richmond. It lie vulnerable to approaches from every direction. Engineers eventually devised an integrated series of earthen fortifications. The exterior line nearly encircled the city. Portions of that line survive today here at Chickahominy Bluff, at the Richmond Airport, at the Park's Fort Harrison unit, and elsewhere on private property. The interior line, composed of a series of, of individual forts, and the intermediate line are almost gone, consumed by Richmond's growth. The simple artillery positions that stood here in June 1862 evolved over time into the more sophisticated permanent defenses visible today. Pretty impressive earthworks, look at that. The Seven Days Battles Begin by the final week of June 1862, the Union Army lies sprawled the east Richmond of Richmond on both sides of the flooded Chickahominy River. General George B. McClellan planned to move that army within artillery range of Richmond. Confederate leader Robert E. Lee was determined to drive McClellan away from the city, even if that meant fighting a major battle. A fractured nation, nation watched these events with intense interest. Here are the generals, Confederate generals, where we are. If there is one man in either army, Federal or Confederate, who is head and shoulders far above every other one in either army in audacity, that man is General Lee. Lee is audacity personified. His name is Audacity. And this is an officer on the staff of Jeff Davis. So. Here's the battlefield map, and let's listen to the recording. June 26th, 1862. In the late morning, an anxious Robert E. Lee ascended the bluffs here and gazed out across the nearly treeless Chickahominy Valley into the tiny hamlet of Mechanicsville. Using binoculars, he watched for the arrival of Stonewall Jackson an indication that the long-awaited attack against the Federals had begun. One Confederate officer recalled the tense scene. The division commanders and a few brigade officers were standing on the road, some in the sun and others grouped back in the shade, and long columns of infantry hidden from observation in the heat. Fifty yards back, sitting in the shade of a few trees, were several dismounted persons, amongst whom I saw President Jefferson Davis and Mr. Randolph, the Secretary of War. No one seemed to be talking to his neighbor, and overall, there seemed to rest a cloud of painful anxiety. Late in the afternoon, the onlookers sprang to their feet when the sound of gunfire was heard. Confederate skirmishers were seen pushing the Federals through Mechanicsville. General Lee approached his senior division commander, General James Longstreet, and said, Those are Hill's men. And then, in a quiet tone, as if he spoke of the weather, he said, General, you may now cross over. Within a short time, nearly 25,000 Confederates crossed the Chickahominy. Lee's offensive, which would become known as the Seven Days Campaign, had finally begun. So here's the spot where the Seven Days Battle commenced. And they ended at Cold Harbor. No not Cold Harbor, Malvern Hill. I was confusing 1864 with 1862. 
impressive earthworks. Well, I took a ride into downtown Richmond along Broad Street, which is right there. And this is the site of Chimborazo Hospital. On this 40 acre plateau, the Confederates built Chimborazo Hospital, one of the largest and best known Civil War military hospitals. 78,000 sick and wounded Reb soldiers passed through the hospital from 61 to 65. Chimborazo's neat rows of buildings enhanced ventilation and served as a model for many post-war hospitals. None of Chimborazo's 150 wooden structures exist today. The large building before you was constructed in 1909 as a federal weather, weather station. It houses the Medical Museum, which tells the story of both the Confederate Medical Service and the dozens of Richmond's other wartime hospitals. This 1865 image is one of only two known photographs of Chimborazo Hospital. The site was named for Mount Chimborazo, a dormant volcano in Ecuador. Why not? And as you can see, the hospital complex was quite extensive. Spreading out all the way across this photograph. <laughs> 